Hi, I'm Eric Pustowski, and welcome to another segment of EP on EP. With me today is a, a former guest to the show, and, but he's always great to have back Dr. Hugh Calkins, who's the Director of Electrophysiology at Johns Hopkins and has done work in our field in many areas. But today, Hugh, I'd like you to talk about ARVC. Great. Well, that's a topic I love to talk about, I, so thank you. I Eric. knew that. So, <laughs> so first of all, I just want to get terminology straight. You know, I always, f since I learned about this when I was a young guy in EP, you know, it was always ARVC, and then you came up with this a a AC, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and like, I'm not really sure now what I'm supposed to call all these things. So could you clarify the nomenclature for yeah. this area? Well, ARVC is the initial sort of disease that Frank Marcus and others focused on, and that we have diagnostic criteria for, we know the most about. This latest document on arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy was a consensus document that Jeff Tobin led. And, and the point of that document is if you have arrhythmias and you have evidence of cardiomyopathy, then it's sort of the big tent approach. You have, by definition, an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, and you need to think about things like inherited heart disease, like ARVC would be one subset of that. I mean, cardiac sarcoidosis is an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Right. So I think the term arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy is really saying when you have someone with arrhythmias and a cardiomyopathy, where the arrhythmias are, pr are a prominent part of how that patient presented, you can use the term arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and just include in your differential diagnosis these inherited uh, cardiomyopathies like ARVC. But I think mm. practically ARVC is what we always know and love. There's something called ALVC, which is left dominant ARVC, but it seems strange to call it ARVC <laughs> that's left dominant. <laughs> right. We're working on developing diagnostic criteria for ALVC. That's a bit in flux. We're really the world's major ARVC centers are putting their data together to come up with new ALVC diagnostic criteria that don't really exist yet. There's some, uh, 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 Domenico Corrado came up with some proposed criteria. We find they aren't terribly uh, helpful in distinguishing cardiac sarcoidosis and other conditions. Okay. So we're working on the next iteration of, you know, how do you diagnose ALVC and so yeah. forth. Well, my only problem when you, that document came out was that um, it made it so general it took away the specifics. So it, there is a difference between sarcoid and ARVC, right? So um, it's like saying somebody's jaundiced. Right, Hugh? It's like, well, what's the cause of the jaundice? So what I didn't like about it, I, had, I read yeah. the document. It's not like I had a problem with it, but I didn't like the fact that it made it uh, everyone's AC. No, I mean, you got to really dig down, correct, and find out what they really have. No, I think Jeff was sort of saying when you have a AC, then here's an AC clinic and you need to go down this kind of a, a okay. it's sort of the, he's trying to grab all, all these the patients. patients and then find <laughs> the ones that are really the inherited heart disease patients yeah. that we really are mainly focused on. But I, I agree, it was an unusual document, but a very ambitious document and it's good we're having this discussion. Yeah, so I'll still be old fashioned if you're okay with yeah. that. Yeah. So let's talk about risk scores. You've spent years looking at these risk scores. Can, can you update us on what's going on with the risk yeah. scores? Well, I mean, I think we all know that there's risk scores that have been developed for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Well, a number of years ago, uh, six or seven of the major international ARVC programs got together to develop a risk score where we have a risk score for risk prediction in ARVC. And that was first published about three years ago. Julia Kedner Teregni was the lead author of that. And we, we got it out there, looked at five-year risks, you know, seven different variables, easy to plop in, number of PVCs, cardiac syncope, T-wave inversion, and so forth. And so that's been out there for about five years, and now we have that score scoring system's been validated. Just earlier this week, we had a paper accepted with a completely different cohort validating mm. that scoring system. So it's not only out there, it's been validated, so it's something for people to be aware of. ARVCrisk.com is, is where you can find it. And then the next criticism we got about that was it predicts sustained VT and you know all sustained ventricular arrhythmias, but we really care about VF and V flutter. And Mark Josephson would have made this point that just sustained VT is it can necessarily kill you. So we developed yet another scoring system for VF and V flutter that was published last year. It's also out there. It hasn't okay. yet been validated, but but anyhow, people should be aware of these scoring is systems, which helps. The conversation when you meet a patient with ARVC and you're talking about five-year risk. So, so is that the same uh, 
would you say ARBC.com? ARBCRisk.com. Risk.com. Yeah. Will that be in there if people want to look it up? Yes, both it's online. Those. You go on your, your phone and there's a little so app. And you both pop. of those yes. characters. That's great. Yeah. That's that's useful information. Yeah. Um, let's, let's pivot a little bit to uh, genetics uh, of this syndrome. Can you put it together for us, yeah. like what, what do we need to know about the genetics of ARVC? Well, it's one of the amazing breakthroughs. You know, when we started our program at Hopkins on ARVC 20 years ago, there wasn't a single uh, a pathogenic variant identified, and now we can find a pathogenic variant or mutation in about two thirds of patients that meet diagnostic criteria for ARVC. So we've come a long way, and now, and what we know is the big, most common one is placophilin 2. That accounts for about two thirds of, of patients. And then another very important one is desmoplakin is probably number two. And what we're learning now is that ARVC caused by placophilin 2 presents one way, looks one way, has X amount of risk, and has a, a progression course you know, that we sort of understand. Desmoplakin is completely different. The EKG hmm. can be com completely normal. It can present as myocarditis with troponin leaks and chest pain. It has a worse course, higher risk, LV involvement. So now it's become, you, you know, it's you have ARVC. Well, do you have desmoplakin ARVC or placophilin 2 ARVC or is it gene elusive ARVC? Hmm. And so we're, we're getting more and more detailed information. Currently, we're putting together a series of over 500 desmoplakin ARVC patients with, from centers all over the world just so we describe the clinical course, you know, clinical features, you know, of that subset of ARVC. So you said something I want to pick up on uh, for clinicians. So if I'm seeing a patient who doesn't have any of the classic ECG findings, um, what are my clues to go look for something like uh, that variety of ARVC? I mean, will I be at least have the anatomic variety when I do a, C a CMR or something? Yeah. So, I mean, one, you have to be aware they can look different, and just because that EKG looks remarkably normal, I mean, if someone has, you know, high number of PVCs, non-sustained VT, or they presented with chest pain and had a troponin leak, you need to be thinking about desmopl you need to be thinking about a genetic condition as the cause of this. Okay. We published a paper this year with 20 patients that initially presented with myocarditis that ultimately had ARVC, most commonly due to desmoplakin. So certainly if you have someone with myocarditis, you should be thinking about a genetic condition like desmoplakin ARVC, and, and, and this is really where genetic testing comes in. So let me, again, let me stop you. So I would, just from experience, I would think you would, things would light up on the left ventricle when, if you did a CMR to suggest myocarditis. Is this one of those varieties that, that's biventricular? Or? Well, with desmoplakin, I mean, you have, usually it's predominantly left ventricular involvement, okay. but you're right that the MRI is extremely useful in, in, you know, in, in picking it up, but it's really genetic testing that plays this huge role that once you know they have a desmoplakin variant, you know, that y okay. you then know what the disease is. And in this series we're putting together, the 500 patient series, it's a gene first approach, meaning w to get into the series, you got to have a desmoplakin mutation. Okay. And then we're going to describe the natural history, the phenotype, and so forth. So uh, bef let's say they don't have myocarditis. Let's say I'm I have a patient that comes to me, EKG looks normal, echo is normal, and they have lots of PVCs. You know, often I'll just, you know, depending on where the PVCs are coming from, I might not do a CMR, right? I mean, if, if it's a if patient, that's the worst of it. Are you suggesting, and maybe not, but I don't put words in your mouth, that I sh that may be a patient I should dig deeper and do some genetic testing? Well, presumably that patient, if they have a unifocal PVCs, you might bring them to the lab, ablate them, and, and you know, and if they ha behave like a typical idiopathic VT and everything is normal, Echo's normal, EKG's normal, there's nothing suspicious, well, yeah. fine, that's an idiopathic VT. But if you have PVCs from multiple morphologies, okay. where then, you get yeah. in there and, and, you, and, and you do EP testing and you have inducible sustained VT, which would be unusual with idiopathic VT, then right. you should say, well, maybe this is an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and maybe this is related. You know, then you get the MRI and you see some gadolinium right. enhancement. Then you say, well, I'm going to get order a, a genetic yeah, panel, panel right. and then all of a sudden you come up come with a diagnosis. But yes, it's... So that's, that's fascinating new data. Um, Anything new on the horizon with genetic manipulation of the disease to cure well, people? What's I mean going the, on? The big excitement now is the whole notion of curing ARVC with gene therapy. So this year, th there's a number of different companies that are working on this. And at this meeting, Tanaya Pharmaceuticals, which I think is based here in San Francisco, is reporting their mouse model 
treatment of placophyllin 2 ARVC where they use an, a, a, you know, one of these adenosine viruses to get yeah. the new gene in there. And, and apparently it was a, it's a very positive study. So the whole concept that in the, hopefully the near future, we can cure or treat ARVC with gene therapy is amazing. That's I was, cool. you know, I was talking to Mike Ackerman about long QT syndrome. Same, they're they're working on the same thing with long QT. Yeah, and I think you know Sylvia Priori has uh, got uh, a model with CPVT. Yeah, that that with genetic manipulation and animal model that I think at some point she told me they were hoping to do clinical trials. I don't know they're there yet, so. I don't want to make well, tell I, anybody something that's not true. But. Well, I know that you know. First comes the animal models, then comes the clinical trials. Exactly. Hopefully, next year or the next time we get together, we'll be talking about the first in man gene Tr therapy trial. for ARVC. <laughs> That'd be great. Now, one thing to be aware of is that everyone's focusing on PKP2 ARVC because it's the most common. That's where the money is. Right. And so that's they aren't you know currently I'm not aware of anyone working on desmoplakin or these other mutations, but P PKP2 is by far the most common. And so stay tuned, and we'll have more to talk about so over the years to come. I'm going to end this with um, something that just, you know, is an important thing for clinicians. And I don't always know what the right advice is to people who want to do athletics. I, I know if you have the, if you've got manifest disease, right, the, there are data that you can make it worse if you do a lot of exercise or competitive athletics. Forget the sudden death risk, yeah. just the disease can progress. But I've never known how I should approach somebody if you're doing genetic testing in a family and they come up gene positive and, and phenotypic negative. Are there good data to say you should preclude, you know, a physical activity? Oh, there's, there's very good data. And actually in this consensus document on arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, they make specific recommendations that if you're gene positive, you know, phenotype negative, but gene positive, you're at risk for ARVC and you should be counseled to avoid endurance and competitive athletics. Now, you may choose, not, that individual may choose not to follow your advice, but the data is overwhelmingly strong from all over the world that, that exercise brings out the, the phenotypic expressive well, disease. And once you get right. the disease, continuing to exercise makes it much more likely you'll develop heart failure, need a transplant, have further well, arrhythmias. Right. I'm gonna stop you only because I understand that part of it, heavy-duty exercise, yeah. but often it's a question of can a kid play school athletics? I mean, would, do you really preclude any competitive athletics for someone who's gene positive? I, I don't know that there's data to support routine athletics. I don't mean endurance <laughs> athletics. Well, there's a nice table in that document which shows you know the kinds of things you I know, can ping pong, you know, and walking, chess, and yes. ping pong, I know. and sailing, but, and whatever. But that isn't realistic but, for but, doctors. But you shouldn't. I mean, the main thing is you shouldn't be. Sending, signing your kid up for a travel soccer team where okay. year round they're doing five hours. <laughs> that of, makes sense. It has to do with intensity and duration. Right. And so you just want to avoid high intensity, long duration. Uh, but then it's all preferences and values and a parent's decision and yeah. so forth. But that's, uh, well, that's good advice. Yeah. So, Hugh, as always, well, thank great you, job. Thank you for educating us. Thank you us. for this opportunity.